Hey, good morning, friends. Is there joy in your hearts this morning? Come on, let's lift it up to God.
we run to you this morning to worship our mighty mighty king a God who loves us a God who calls us by name we bring you our burdens we bring you all things we lay at your feet and I've carried a burden for too long on my own
place to run to, our refuge, our strong tower. God, we weren't meant to carry this burden alone, but by your grace and your mercy, you can wash us clean, you can make us whole. God, we bring you our burdens. We lay them at your feet. We repent of the sins that we've committed. God, we ask that you would forgive us, Lord. Make us whole, wash us clean. We run to you, God. You are where our help comes from. We will run to you, Father God. Thank you for calling us your children. We can stand confident knowing today that we are your sons, your daughters. And thank you for loving us so much. What a sweet time of worship this is. To your mighty name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Have a seat. now enter into our time of communion. Every Sunday here at Hope Christian Church, we celebrate communion together. And some say that that's too much, um, that if you do it too often, then it kind of loses its meaning. Uh, we feel it's exactly the opposite. We feel you can never remember Jesus too much, right church? We can never remember Jesus too much. If this time becomes routine for us, then the problem is with us. Something's wrong with us. It's not with the frequency with which we are doing the Lord's Supper. And, and, and why do we celebrate the Lord's Supper? You may wonder that. Well, there's a simple reason that we celebrate the Lord's Supper, and that is because that Jesus commanded us to do this when we get together. This is something that Jesus himself started on the night that he was betrayed when he had a dinner with his disciples as he was eating with them, he said, do this in remembrance of me. And Jesus says that we can't call him Lord if we don't do what he says. It's all right here in Luke chapter six. So, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching and then follows it. It is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it is well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. You know, this time of remembering Jesus is one way to ensure that our foundation is strong, that our foundation is on solid rock. Jesus gave us the Lord's Supper to strengthen our faith and our union with him. What we're doing here, what we're about to do is feed on Jesus spiritually, as if you will. So um, the communion elements are in the seat back in front of you. And uh, there are two tabs here. There's one, the cellophane tab that opens your bread and then the foil tab opens your juice. Let's open the cellophane tab together here and just take out the bread and hold it. This bread represents the body of Jesus Christ that was given for us, that was broken for us, that was crucified on the cross for us. Let's take the bread and eat the bread. Now we'll all carefully pull back the foil tab here. Here's our juice. Hold the juice. This juice represents the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. So that's what we're doing here today. We're remembering Jesus as we drink the juice. so thankful um, to be gathered here today in this room together as a church family. 
thank you today for bringing us together as brothers and sisters in Christ who are remembering you today. It's a privilege to remember what you did for us. Thank you. Without your sacrifice on the cross, where would we be? Lord, um, we want to lift up a prayer to you now and then continue with our worship today and open your word and learn from you. So Father, we just want to thank you for commanding the Lord's Supper. And we want to thank you today for giving us this time to pause in obedience to you. But we're doing what you commanded us to do, Lord. May there be a blessing in this. May it first of all honor you, but then may it strengthen our faith. May it strengthen our union with you. Lord, may the bread and the juice that we've eaten together today strengthen our souls. That is our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. My name is Bob. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Hope, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. I'm just getting out my cheat sheet because we have a ton of information for you today. If you'll just stick with me for a moment, I want to tell you some of the things that are going on in the church. By the way, if you're watching online today, thank you for being there as well. Good to be together today as a church family on this hot and muggy, sunny day. Um, welcome to all of you. Uh, there are three primary ways to stay connected to the church. Uh, they are our website, hopechristianchurch.com, our Facebook page, and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. We'd love for you to do that. One other way I'll mention is to get our weekly email newsletter that comes to your inbox every week. About a thousand of those are going out to email addresses all around the world, and uh, we hope that you'll sign up for that. You go to the homepage of our website at hopechristianchurch.com and uh, request uh, to receive the weekly email newsletter. That's how you stay in touch. Women's Bible study. Uh, the women's Bible study meets on Tuesdays at 9.30 in the morning and seven o'clock at night. This is an identical study just with convenient times for you. Women are about to begin a new study. It's called Culture Shock. This is a study that the men have been doing and the feedback on that has been awesome. So we're going to offer it to our women as well. It starts on July 13th and we have uh, the study guides for Culture Shock at the information desk this morning if you'd like to pick that up. Got a big serve day coming up. That's where we as a church get together and we serve around the church. And so our, our serve day is coming up on July 17th uh, with a rain date for the 24th. Uh, I mention that because we're gonna be outside. We're gonna have a tractor trailer, a sized load of mulch delivered here and we're gonna spread it all around where the parking lot area is and also back where we have a beautiful children's playground back there. That's gonna be on the 17th. We're going to start at 8 o'clock in the morning before it gets too hot. And the more, the merrier. The more people we have, uh, the faster this will get done. Uh, we've done it in as little as 90 minutes before with a tractor-trailer-sized load of mulch. So that'll tell you what can get done. If you would um, please consider coming to that, we'd love to have you. Again, at 8 o'clock, we'll feed you a light breakfast, and then we'll all get out there and get some work done around the church. Movie nights coming up on July 9th. We have a beautiful back lawn there. Looks like this. We're going to put a giant screen up, and we're going to show the film Inside Out. Great movie, and that's going to be on July 9th. Uh, we're, doors are going to open up right around 8.30. We're going to start the movie at 9. We're going to give you popcorn. We're going to give you candy and drinks and uh, uh, get you all tanked up to watch Inside Out. So please come to that. Uh, July 9th, VBS. A VBS is August 5th, 6th, and 7th here in the church. That's a, fifth, sixth, uh, that, that's a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Registration for VBS opens today. You go online and you can register your child for VBS. It's really easy to find out how to get to the right page. You just go to the home page and there's this logo on the home page. Click on that and you can register your child. Also, please register yourself to volunteer for this if you could. Uh, we need about 60 volunteers and we have about a third of that signed up right now. So if you would, please consider helping us out at our VBS uh, Thursday night, Friday night, and then Saturday morning. Uh, you can find all about it um, on our website at hopechristianchurch.com. And then the next day, on the Sunday following the Saturday there, we are going to have a Sunday fun day on the back lawn. And let me tell you about that. That is going to be just a great time. We're gonna have fried chicken, we're gonna have macaroni and cheese, we're gonna have green beans, we're gonna have coleslaw, we're gonna have these giant 
giant cookies that you can enjoy. It's all free. There's no charge for this. You just come and have a good time as a church family. We're going to have two bounce houses for the kids, one for the little ones, one um, for the big ones. going to have a maze. We're going to have a giant water slide, 21 feet high, and I am going to be on that slide. That's where you'll find me. I'm excited about that. So get ready for that. That's going to be August 8th. Uh, get all of these things on your calendar because we're going to have a good time as a church family. You won't want to miss these events. Whew. It's a lot, isn't it? All right. I'm done. All right. Let's bring out. <laughs> Thank you. I'm done. <laughs> all right. We're going to begin a new series today. Pastor Neil's here and we're going to um, start it right now. It's called Framework. All right. Here we go. Good morning. And to those of you joining us online, good morning to you as well. Thanks for being with us today. I always stand in the back on the ramp there uh, while, you know, Bob's doing announcements. And it's always interesting to listen what gets reactions from you. And there were two big reactions today. The first one was to fried chicken. <laughs> like literally, I was like, oh, Jesus is real. <laughs> and then apparently Bob going down the water slide, you guys are going <laughs> to... <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, we're hoping he'll, uh, we're hoping he'll fare well on that. So uh, that's good. No, but uh, we're excited about Sunday Fun Day. It's been a long time since we've just been able to gather and just watch each other chew. And that's what, <laughs> that's what we want to do. We just want to get together and just eat some food and be a church family. And so I encourage you to, to sign up or, uh, or show up, rather, to Sunday Fun Day. It's going to be a great time. It's similar to like our church picnics. We're just calling it Sunday Fun Day now. Uh, so invite your friends to that as well. We're uh, getting a lot of food, and we don't want to have a bunch of food left over, and we'd love to meet your friends and your family. So anybody that you run into you think might want to hang out at the church and eat fried chicken, macaroni, and cheese, and see Bob go mock six down a water slide, invite your friends. We're excited about that. Speaking of Bob, speaking of Bob, last week, uh, Bob shared a very powerful message on prayer. And as a part of his message, as a part of his sermon, he shared with all of us at church family that he's in those early stages of diagnosing and treating prostate cancer. And a part of Bob's sermon, he was sharing how Paul asked people to pray for him, and then Bob asked us to pray for him as well. And I want to do that now. I want to do that as a church family, whether you're sitting here, whether you're watching online at home, whether you're watching Sunday Live or watching sometime this week. Let's just stop down and pray for Bob and pray uh, for Sonny. We serve a God who can heal. There is absolutely zero question about that. And I know that um, Bob and Sonny want most of all God's will to be done. Uh, but we're going to come boldly before our God. And we're going to ask God to heal Bob. Bob has an MRI coming up uh, early August. And my prayer has been that that MRI would come back clear. And so I would ask you to join me in that prayer. And so let's just take a, a minute or two uh, silently to ourselves, and then I'll close us. Father, we love Bob. We love Bob and we love Sonny. And Lord, we love them for so many reasons. Lord, I love Bob's passion. I love his joy, his wisdom, his grace, his fire for you. And Lord, if... We love him for those things. How much more do you love him for all that you know that he is? 
God, you knit Bob in the womb. You formed him. You're aware of everything that's happening right now in his body. This is no surprise to you, no shock to you. And since the moment that Bob was diagnosed, I know Bob's desire and Sonny's desire has been to honor you through this journey. But your word says in Philippians chapter 4, not to be anxious about anything, but in all things through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, make our requests known. And so, Father, we want to start just by thanking you for being a God who can and does heal. Being a God that works all things together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. Being a gracious, merciful God, we thank you for that, Lord. But, Lord, we come boldly before you. And we ask you to heal Bob. Heal him, Father. I pray that when the MRI results come back, that there is nothing. And Lord, we don't ask that for Bob because we think Bob deserves it. We know Bob's broken just like we're broken, but we know that you aren't. But Lord, we want your will. So we pray for your will. We ask that that be your will. Father, help us to do our part in supporting the Bowers, whatever they need, whether it's a a physical need, an emotional, a mental need. And Lord, help us to do our part to pray, to pray diligently. I pray that that this wouldn't just be a one and done, and then a couple weeks later we're like, oh yeah, that's right about Bob. I pray that we would pray fervently for Bob, or that you would use this to grow our faith. Father, we trust you. We love you. We know your plans are always good. And God, we pray all these things in the powerful, mighty, and holy, majestic name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen, amen. So we are kicking off a brand new series today called Framework. So what is a framework? Well, it kind of depends on the context with which you use the word. In the context of building construction, a framework is this. It's a supporting structure around which something can be built. A supporting structure around which something can be built. For example, look at this. What is this? It's a house. We know it's a house. Why? Well, it's not a completed house, but we know it's a house because the framework is up. The framing is up. We see the garage. You know, you can see some windows up there, a front door. And when we see something like this, whether it's on a screen or whether we've driven through neighborhoods and have seen houses being built, when we see something like this, it doesn't give us pause. It's no reason for concern. We look at that and we go, that's a house. And that seems like a pretty solid house because it's made out of good material. The majority of houses, I believe, I'm not in the construction industry, but are made this way out of wood. And we look at that and we go, that's a solid house. Somebody could live there and be completely safe and the house is going to last as long as it gets taken care of. But if we were to drive through the same neighborhoods and see houses being erected or frameworks being built out of paper mache, that might give us some pause, right? Because we know paper mache can, if anybody's ever done a science fair experiment, we know it can hold its form and hold its shape, but it certainly can't be stable. It can't be secure. It can't be steady. It's not strong. It's easily blown down, and we know the rain would probably destroy it. And so if we saw a paper mache house, we would say, nobody live there because that house can't last, it won't last, and it would be incredibly dangerous to live in. But obviously, we're not going to spend the next three weeks talking about uh, framework as it relates to building construction. So there must be another definition for this word. So let's put it in the context of an organization. What is an organizational framework? Well, it's the ideas, information, and principles that form the structure of an organization. It's the ideas and information and principles that form the structure of an organization. It's It's what the company is built around. It's the principles, the vision, the mission that the company is built around. And just like a house that's made out of the wrong materials can't last, won't last, and would be incredibly dangerous to live in, so an organization that's made out of the wrong materials has the wrong framework, can't last, won't last, and would be incredibly dangerous to be a part of, so goes the church. You see, every church as a framework. Every church has a structure, something it's built around. And if the church isn't built around the right materials, if it's a paper mache church, the church can't last, 
It won't last. And it would be incredibly dangerous to be a part of. And brothers and sisters, right now, as we are here at 1050 on Sunday morning, people are attending paper mache churches in droves. Churches that are made out of the wrong stuff. Churches that are built out of the wrong material. So we need to talk about this, and that's exactly what we're going to do. For the next three weeks, we're going to take a look at the structure, the framework of the church. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to take a look at the book of Titus. Titus is a very short book. It's three chapters. We're going to take a look at every chapter. And the reason we're going to do it this way is because Paul gives Titus the framework for the church. He does it in three main parts. We're going to talk about the messenger. We're going to talk about the message next week. And then the following week after that, we'll talk about the masses. And so we're going to read every bit of Titus throughout this series. And we're going to start in chapter 1, but before we start digging into chapter 1, I want to spend just a few minutes and give you a little bit of background about this book. The book of Titus was written by the Apostle Paul. It was written sometime probably between 62 and 64 AD while Paul was ministering to some Macedonian churches, probably in between his first and second Roman imprisonments. And this book, Titus, is a part of something known as the pastoral epistles. There's three pastoral epistles. There's First and Second Timothy, and then Titus. And the big difference between these pastoral epistles and other epistles, letters, uh, like Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, is that the pastoral epistles were written specifically to pastors. And in this case, specifically to Titus, where Galatians and Ephesians were written to the church at large. And so the book of Titus was written to a guy named Titus. So who's Titus? Well, Titus was a young Gentile convert led to Christ by Paul. And he would have spent a lot of time with Paul. He would have been on uh, missionary journeys with Paul and Barnabas. More than likely, he would have been at that council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. We talked about this a few weeks back when we were talking about works and how Gentiles, now salvation was available to Gentiles and the Jewish people were saying you need to get circumcised and and so they had this you know, big meeting in Jerusalem and, and, and Paul would have been there and likely Titus would have been there as well. So he spent a lot of time with Paul and at some point he and Paul wind up in Crete and Paul tells Titus, you need to stay here and you need to establish the church. And so what he does in this letter to Titus is he gives him the framework. This is how you build the church. And so we're going to examine that today. So we're going to start in verse 1. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up, and we're going to take this in chunks. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. So in verse 1, we see Paul identify himself. Paul, a servant of God. There's no reason to question that Paul was the author of this book. In verse number 2, he starts to state the intent of it in, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. And then in verse 3, he establishes his apostolic and spiritual authority. And at the proper time, manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted. And then here's it, by the command of God our Savior. If you'll recall... Paul had several conversations with Jesus, the first one being the road to Damascus, God letting Paul know, Jesus letting Paul know, this is why you're here, this is your mission, this is what you're going to do. And so Paul is reminding Titus here, like, hey, I'm doing this because Jesus himself has given me this command. He's establishing his apostolic authority. Let's go on to verse 4. To Titus, my true child in common faith, grace and peace from God the Father, and Christ Jesus our Savior. So in verse 4, he establishes who the letter is to. To Titus. Dear Titus. It's basically what he's saying. To Titus. And then this next phrase is really important. My true child in a common faith. By very nature that Paul is calling Titus his true child is letting us know that Paul is one that led Titus to faith. Obviously, Titus' spiritual, ultimate spiritual father is is God, is Jesus, right? Father with a capital F, but his 
lowercase f spiritual father would have been Paul. That's why he's calling him his child because through the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul was able to lead Titus to being born again. So he's a new child, my true child in common faith. And then he continues with a very standard greeting for Paul, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Verse five. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order, so that you can build the framework and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and are not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced. Since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain, what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths, And the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. There is a lot to unpack there. But what we are going to do is we're going to focus on the first chunk of this. I'm going to read it again. This is why I left you in Crete, that you may might put what remained into order, build the framework, and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers, not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. What is Paul doing here? He is establishing the framework for what a pastor should be. He's establishing the framework for leadership in the church, specifically pastoral leadership. Now, the word that Paul uses is the word elder. And as we've talked about in the past, the term elder, pastor, bishop, overseer are all interchangeable terms. They can be swapped in and out. And what Paul is doing here is he's saying, this is what pastors need to be. This is what elders, overseers, shepherds need to be. And why is he doing that? Because Paul knows the messenger matters. Paul knows the messenger matters. You see, you can have an unbelievable message, an incredible message. You can have the best message. We have the best message in the world, amen? Amen. But if the messenger is broken, if the messenger's framework is made out of the wrong materials, then the message can't get lost, and often the messenger can overtake the message. And what we're seeing happen, and what we've been seeing happen in the church, is messenger after messenger after messenger fall because of sin. In fact, in the last five years, some of the biggest names in the Christian world have fallen. Some of the biggest messengers in the Christian world have fallen because of sin. And these names may not mean much to you, but I assure you they are giants in the world of Christianity. Guys like Mark Driscoll. Mark Driscoll pastored a church. Mars Hill was a massive church, 10, 15,000 people. And he abused his power, he plagiarized, and the church was closed. James McDonald pastor of a massive church, abuse of power. Perry Noble, an absolutely massive church, 20, 25,000 people, abuse of power and alcoholism. Ravi Zacharias, one of the most well-known apologists of the last 30 or 40 
years. As he was still living and still in ministry, there were some sexual allegations. Then he dies, and all this stuff comes to light. Sexual immorality. Carl Lentz from Hillsong, sexual immorality. Bill Hybels, sexual immorality. Andy Savage, sexual immorality. Harry Thomas, sexual immorality. Jerry Falwell Jr., not a pastor of a church, but the dean of Liberty University, the largest Christian university in the world. Sexual immorality. And the list of messengers that have been broken and fallen because of sin goes on and on and on. This is why Paul gives us the framework for the messenger. Because the messenger matters. So we're going to take a look at this list of qualifications for elders and pastors one by one. Verse 6. If anyone is above reproach, if anyone is above reproach, this is probably the most difficult one to understand, especially if you just kind of read it and move on. Because at first glance, you look at this and go above reproach. Well, I mean, who's above reproach? Who's sinless? The answer is nobody. But remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about works and we talked about sin. We talked about sexual immorality, all this building towards this. Knowing Jesus doesn't make you sinless, but it does make you sinless. And so this can't mean that a pastor has to be sinless, or else we've got no pastors. We're fresh out of sinless pastors. Somebody bought the last one. There was a run on those during COVID. <laughs> Toilet paper and pastors. That's what they had really snatched up. <laughs> yeah, that's in my notes. I actually put that. No, I'm kidding. Now, here's what this means. A pastor must live a life that doesn't open them up to legitimate accusation or scandal. Part of what this means is that a pastor must live a life that doesn't open them up to legitimate accusation or scandal. The key word being legitimate. Because there can be some claims about people, we know this just living life, right, that aren't legitimate. Even in that list that I read, it's possible that some of the claims that were against these men weren't legitimate. It's possible. Anything's possible. In fact, in my short 12 years of ministry, I've had people accuse me of things that weren't legitimate. Things like motive. Here's why you're doing what you're doing. Even when I was leading worship, I'd play a guitar solo and somebody would be like, you're just showing off. I'm like, it was in the song. I didn't write it. <laughs> like Lincoln Brewster wrote it. I mean, that's how it was. And so you got to make sure those claims are legitimate. But being above reproach, it means more than just this. This is just one half of it. The other half of it comes from Colossians chapter 1. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless. And, and here's this language, above reproach. Above reproach before him. And then this is the big word, if. You want to be above reproach, you're above reproach if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. What's that mean? Here's what it means. Here's what being above reproach means. Being above reproach doesn't just mean staying out of trouble. It means staying in the faith. It doesn't just mean staying out of trouble. It means staying in the faith. That needs further explanation because some of us are like, wait a second. I thought you couldn't lose your faith. I thought you can't lose salvation. Didn't you just tell us a few weeks ago that God chose us? And so I'm not talking about salvific faith in the sense of faith that saves. I'm talking about a faith that wavers. And we all know what that's like. Rachel and I just are just coming out of a season of that. Literally in the last week. Two Thursdays ago, Henry wound up with 103 fever. Okay, that happens. It's a bit of a bummer because it's summertime. No big deal. Give him the Motrin, that whole thing. Friday comes, he won't eat his dinner. His throat is sore. It's like 6 o'clock at night. we got to go to urgent care. We're thinking he's got strep throat. They do a culture. He's got strep throat. They look in his ears. He's got an inner ear infection. Okay, they prescribe some medicine for him. They're like, you know, he should be doing better in a, in a day or two because, you know, the antibiotics come in. And that's what they do. It kills the bacteria. Well, Two and a half days of medicine, Henry's fever is still running at 103, and he's even worse. So I, I, I'm thinking, I'm literally, you know, uh, in the bathroom, like, brushing my teeth, and I'm thinking, and I'm like, I wonder if his dosing is wrong. What do I know about dosing? 
The answer is nothing. I know nothing about dosing, but this is the early part of the Lord moving. And so we call the pharmacist. We're like, here's what he's got. They're like, yeah, his dosing is half of what it needs to be. Okay? So this is, this is all happening on Sunday, Father's Day. So we go to the ER because that's the only thing open. They take a look at him. Now he's got a double ear infection. Strep's still cranking. We're like, okay, let's get him the right dose. They give him the right dose of amoxicillin. They're like, a couple days he should be fine. Two days, or Sunday night, Monday morning at 1.30 in the morning, we'd given him that double dose of amoxicillin. We wake Henry up because we got to give him some more Motrin because he can't, you know, he can't sleep with 103 fever. And I asked him, like, hey, buddy, you need to go pee. I almost just said pee-pee. <laughs> you got you to gotta make a tinky? Got a tinky in the toilet? <laughs> yeah, I say pee-pee at home. So I was like, hey, buddy, do you got to go, do you have to make? <laughs> And he slid off the bed, and he went to stand up, and he started screaming that his legs hurt. And he said, I can't walk, I can't walk, I can't walk. I'm like, okay, it's the middle of the night, it's 1.30, he's got a leg cramp, I'm rubbing his legs. We're up for about a half hour, and we finally get him to stand. But he, he couldn't, he had no motor function. He was walking like someone who had like muscular dystrophy. So we finally calm him down, we, get, we pray, get him back to bed. And we're like, let's see how he's doing in the morning. He wakes up the next morning, same thing. Seven in the morning, we're back at the ER. Now, they had misdiagnosed and, and, uh, you know, the dosing. He had a bacteria. We're thinking bacterial meningitis. We just went from zero to 60. But we're parents. Parents, don't you do that sometimes. So my faith starts to waver a little bit. I start to get a little I, terrified. My, my, my kid can't walk. So we take him to the doctor. The doctor's like, maybe you got a toddler fracture. They're doing x-rays. Nobody can figure out what's going on. They're like, follow up with your pediatrician. We're like, this <laughs> like... He can't walk. So we follow up with a pediatrician, and on Monday night, Rachel happened to be texting my sister-in-law, and she was telling her what was going on with Henry, and my sister-in-law said, I wonder if he has viral myositis. My nephew got that one time, which was her son. And so we look it up, and it's symptom for symptom, exactly what Henry had. When you have a virus or bacteria too long, the toxins build up, they store in your legs, and then your legs don't work. You lose motor function. And it was just absolutely terrifying. But my faith was wavering. I would love to tell you that the moment that Henry couldn't walk, I was like, oh yeah, Lord. No, the first thing I went to is Henry had a cancerous tumor in his chest and he had it removed. So what's going on? What's happening? Little update, Henry's good. It was the coolest thing a few days ago. <laughs> he look up and he always yells in the monitor. I've told Henry to do a thousand things. When he first got a big boy bed, I said, don't get out of this bed. That is the only thing he's listened to. <laughs> he literally, he's like, dad, come get me. And I'm at the point now where I'm like, get up. You're 17. You're late for work. I tell him all kinds of stuff. He does all that. So he looks in the monitor. He's like, yo, 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 come in and get me. So I come in and get him. And he looks at me. He goes, do you think my legs are going to work? I know, I know right? <laughs> and I said, I believe they will. I said, I believe Jesus healed you. And he got out of bed and he slid down and he stood up against a huge grin on his face and went, Jesus fixed me! <laughs> yes, amen. And he ran in the room and he was like, Jesus fixed me! And Rachel's like, I'm sleeping! <laughs> Get out of here, I don't care. No, it's not true. It's super sweet. The whole day, I'm not exaggerating, the whole day he's like, Jesus fixed me, Jesus fixed me. So the Lord works all things together for the good of those that love him. But I can't sit here and tell you I wasn't terrified. I didn't sleep for six days up laboring, praying for my son. And I am a professional Christian. I do. They pay me for this. <laughs> Actually, you guys pay me for this. <laughs> Thanks. Who bought my breakfast yesterday? Do you? <laughs> I went out to lunch with somebody one time. They came to the church and... Uh, I was, you know, it's that weird thing where people reach for the bill. And I was like, I got it. And they're like, no, I got it. And I go, y you still do even if I pay for it. <laughs> uh, I was like, it's all the same. <laughs> it's all the same. I do my best to stay out of trouble. And I do my best to stay in the faith. But it can be difficult. That's what above approach means. Let's keep going. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife. The husband of one wife. This means a couple of different things. The first thing it means is that a pastor must be a man. 
A pastor must be a man. I know this is not the popular view, but it is the biblical one. And it seems like every time I share, listen to my words, every time I share what the Bible says, I didn't say this. I did not write this. But every time I share what God's word says about this, somebody gets all fired up. If you're fired up, don't get fired up. Go back and listen to a sermon series called Dinner Rolls. I talk about the role of men and women in the church. Women, you are incredibly valuable. In fact, I'm going to go so far as to say, and this is absolutely true, when there is a need at the church, our women step up. Our men do not. Women, you are valued. You are loved. We want to hear from you. We, we value you. It's just a different function. That's it. Equal in value, different in function. But being a husband of one wife doesn't just mean that a pastor must be a man. It, must be, it means that a pastor must be a one-woman man. And this is talking about sexual purity. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about sexual immorality, right? And you remember that list I just read? Remember the role we were on? Sexual immorality, sexual immorality. This is a big deal. This is a big issue. And so when it says a husband of one wife, this is talking about being a one-woman man. In other words, if you are married as a pastor, your wife needs to be your standard of beauty. There is no lusting. There is no pornography. You do your best. You're not sinless because you're broken, but you do your best to sin less. That's what this means. This does not mean that a single man cannot be a pastor. If that's what it means, then we got problems because Jesus was single, Paul was single, and there were a lot more. So it can't mean that. And it also doesn't mean that a divorced man cannot be a pastor. But there is an asterisk next to that because the situation of the divorce and how it happened need to be unearthed because God's word has a lot to say about divorce. So pastor must be a one, a one woman man. Pastor must be a man. Let's keep going. And his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. This one's really tricky. Timothy gives us a similar list. Paul gives us a similar list in Timothy, rather. And in Timothy, it seems like Paul is speaking more about younger children. This seems to lend itself a little bit more to open children because most younger children are being charged with insubordination in, in, in that same degree, debauchery, all those sorts of things. But... Where the problem lies, or where the difficulty in interpretation lies, is, for example, I've got a young child. And in Timothy, it says your children must be believers. Henry's four and a half. Henry hasn't made a decision for Jesus Christ. He doesn't even know what that is at this point. He understands the mechanics of it, but the Lord hasn't turned that switch on. Henry doesn't know enough. I asked Henry the other day who's in charge of the weather. He said, Picos Hank. <laughs> Picos Hank is a, is a tornado YouTube channel he watches. He thinks the guy who follows tornadoes is in charge of the weather. So Henry's not making a decision for Jesus Christ. I was just back in the East Wing, and I just went back there. And on the stage uh, were the Swidrack twins, Addie and Avery. Were on the, they weren't supposed to be. <laughs> Pastor's kids, right? But Martha Babbitt, who sings up here, you know Martha, she's like that tall with a voice like an angel. That Martha, she's back there singing for the kids, and Addie and Avery are like, get out of here. Like, we got this. And they're doing that but they don't really understand what they're doing, right? So it can't be young kids have to make a decision, but then you've got older kids that sometimes walk away. I had a 12-year prodigal period where I was out of the faith, but the Lord brought me back. So God decides the timing of all of that. I think a better way to understand this, and at least what we can as pastors and elders move towards, is managing our households well. That's really what this is speaking towards. If you can't manage your household well as head of the household, then you can't manage the church. You can't direct the affairs of the church. I think that's the easiest way to understand this. And the nuance of when a child comes to faith has to be left up to God because God chooses. Verse 7. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. These are pretty self-explanatory. An overseer as God's steward, right? And what is stewardship? It's the God-honoring management of what's been entrusted to you must be above reproach. You gotta stay out of trouble, stay in the faith. And then here's some don'ts. He must not be arrogant. Can't be arrogant. Why? Because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. That's what the Bible says. You don't want an arrogant. This is where churches start to get themselves in trouble. You can't, you start to abuse power as a pastor when you start to believe your own hype. This is a really weird job. It's a really weird job because you have a captive audience. I'm the guy with the mic. I'm the one doing the studying. And so it puts us as pastors in a position to start to well up. If a church starts to grow, if people start to go, wow, that was a great sermon. You just say, yeah, I know, right? It's like, <laughs> right? 
you got to be careful with it. It's a really tough thing. It's a tough thing. So you can't be arrogant or quick-tempered. can't be quick-tempered. James talks about being slow, quick to listen, slow to get angry. If you're quick-tempered in this job, you're going to lose it because you deal with people. I'm just going to say it. People are frustrating, right? They are. If you've ever been in the people business, you know how frustrating it can be. I have so many times where I'm sitting down with people and I'm like, okay, here's what the Bible says that. And they'll say things like, I know what the Bible says, but. You can't say but. There is no I know what the Bible says, but. There is I know what the Bible says, and then you stop. <laughs> and then you repent. That's how, it, that's how it works. And so if you're quick-tempered, if you get frustrated easy, you can't, you can't do it. Fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. Patience, patience. You need patience. Or a drunkard. Pretty self-explanatory there. The Bible speaks against drunkenness. It speaks to sober mind. You guys don't want me out there getting hammered? <laughs> Apparently some of you do. <laughs> There's video out there. I was much younger, I'm sure of it. <laughs> or violent, self-explanatory. Or greedy for gain, self-explanatory. Let's keep moving. But hospitable. A lover of good. Self-controlled. Upright. Holy. And discipline. We just got done with that list of don'ts. Here's some do's. Pastor needs to be hospitable. What's that mean? The word that Paul uses in the Greek literally means lover of strangers. You gotta like people. If you don't like people, you can't be a pastor, you can't be an elder. It's not gonna work. Because that's what you do. Your job is to equip God's people to do God's work. You can't equip God's people if you don't like people. You have to interact with people. Lover of good. What's that mean? Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. That's what it means. You love good things. Who's good? Jesus, God, the Bible, Holy Spirit. There's a list of a lot of good things. Fried chicken, apparently. <laughs> Bob down a water slide. Very good. Self-controlled and disciplined at the end. Those two are together. Self-controlled and disciplined. This is really important. This is where a lot of pastors really start to lose it. It's living a disciplined life. You work, you go to theology school, you or you work your way up in and through the church and you finally get that position or that title of lead pastor or whatever it is, executive pastor, worship pastor, and now you just kind of sit and rest on the laurels of it. And you forget how much, how desperately you are in need of the very grace that you preach about all the time. You need to live a disciplined life in every area. You need to be disciplined with your emotions. You need discipline with your money. You need to be disciplined in your time of study, discipline in your time of prayer, discipline in your interactions, discipline in your sins. If you're a person that struggles with a particular sin and you're in the pastor, you need to be aware of that. I think you need to be disciplined and a good steward of your physical body. I think that's really important. I think we see that a lot where pastors will just get lazy and they won't take care of themselves. Discipline with your family, making sure you're investing in your kids. It's very easy to invest more time in you than my family. That's easy. You can't do that. It requires self-control and discipline. And then upright and holy are together. This is not talking about positional holiness as before the Lord. This is talking about progressive holiness. In other words, becoming more like Jesus. Verse 9. He must Hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. A pastor must teach sound doctrine. And we're going to get into this next week when we talk about the message. This is quite a list, isn't it? It is. And some of us may be looking at this list and thinking, okay, this is good information, but it seems like it's really good information for you, Neil. <laughs> and the rest of the staff and the elders. And that's absolutely true. This is it for us. This is our job description. This is our framework. This is what we need to be. But whether you realize it or not, this is absolutely crucial for you. Why? Because you're here. Because you're watching. You're in this house. And you are under this leadership. And if this is a paper mache house, if this is built out of the wrong materials, you need to be able to identify that. You need to know 
there's a standard. A standard for the messenger. A standard for the message. And then a standard for the masses. A standard for you as well. What winds up happening is we move to a city and we Google search churches in Avon, churches in Avon Lake, and we start, we start trying them. We dip our toe in the water and we're like, don't like that music. We run down the road, we're like, I'm not, I'm not, I don't speak in tongues. <laughs> and you move on down the road or you're like, I'm not wearing a suit. <laughs> That's not happening. And then you wind up at a place like Hope a non-denominational church with a contemporary band and teaching pastors. And you're like, the music is pretty good here. And that guy makes me chuckle sometimes. He said pee-pee once. (laughs) I like that guy. And then what do you do? You grow roots. And then you just stay. But you've never examined the framework. If any of you has ever bought a house or rented an apartment... Didn't you go look at it? When you bought the house, didn't you have it inspected? Didn't you pay to have somebody come in and go, yeah, this wiring's gonna burn the place down. You're gonna wanna get that fixed. Or yeah, hey, the toilets don't flush. You're gonna wanna get that fixed. Don't you examine it? When you buy a car, don't you take it for a test drive and look at it, do some research? Yet, the thing that is determining and affecting our eternity and our impact on the world today as faithful followers of Jesus Christ, where we come to be equipped for God's word, we're like, it's close to home. That guy, he's okay. You need to know what the standard is. And what a weird sermon for me to preach. It is. Because I'm saying, examine us. And if it's not right, Get out. Get out. Run for the hills. What gets churches in trouble is congregations, people come in and they sit and they go, whatever that guy says. Yeah, no, he's, he is from God. He's a messenger. of, And yes, of course, but we're all ministers of the gospel. I do it three and a half feet higher under some lights in a building dedicated for that. And I'm not diminishing my calling or my role. It's important, it's vital, and it's unique. Not everyone's called to do it. But if you elevate, venerate, celebrate, and decorate your pastors too much, you are setting them up for failure. No person can handle what gets thrown at them. I get the weirdest versions of people. You should see, I've seen parents yelling at their kids at Target. And I'm like, hi, and they're like, My goodness, how long have you been there? (laughs) No, we're just here for toilet paper. Yeah, it's due to COVID. (laughs) Right, I get weird versions. I'll introduce myself, what are you doing? I'm a pastor. And then they apologize for the 17 F words they said before that. (laughs) It's the truth. They're like, oh man, sorry about all that. It's a dangerous job and a dangerous place to be. So you need to know what the standard is because you're here. But that's not the only reason you need to know the standard. People are going to paper mache churches in droves. They are flocking to them because they tell you, God wants you to be rich. Oh, if Pastor Bob had enough faith, he wouldn't have cancer. Yeah, let's just pray that away. God wants you to be healthy. By his wounds, you're already healed. And while you're here, if you could just make the check out too. And they're flocking there because they're watering down and twisting God's word. And so we need to know, you need to have confidence in your pastors and elders here so that you can get people here. We should want this place filled Why? Because Hope Christian Church is not a paper mache church by the power of God. This is a church that preaches sound doctrine, and it is a church whose leaders have been vetted. Don't believe me? Go ask Zach. We we spent a year praying about Zach and three months putting him through torture. I did everything I could to scare the kid out of ministry. But God has called Zach. You need to have confidence in Pastor Bob and Pastor David 
and Pastor Mark and Pastor Chad and Pastor Zach. You need to have confidence. This is Dave Musser. Dave, raise your hand. This is Dave. He's one of our lay elders. Have confidence in this man. Dave has labored with us for decades. He is a biblically qualified elder. Brett Baldy's not here. He quit when I heard I was preaching on this. No. <laughs> Brett's our other lay elder. Powerful man of God. I want you to have confidence in your leadership. And like Hebrews 13 says, don't make this sorrowful for us to lead this church. That's also in the Bible, not my words. Don't make this really difficult. Don't make it crazy hard for us. Don't nitpick stuff. I wish the walls were, man, we're talking about paint. We're not doing this. We're here to connect people to Jesus. We're here to equip God's people to do God's work. So don't make it sorrowful, make it a joy. But you better hold us accountable. The worst thing you can do is take everything that comes out of my mouth and go, well, that's, that's uh, totally true, all the time. If it doesn't feel right, if the Spirit's prompting you, go look it up. Let's have conversations about it. Be prepared. Don't come with an opinion. You got to come with God's word. But we welcome that. It's what it's supposed to be. If you transfer too much power to me, I'm going to mess it up. I'm going to be like, it's Van Halen Sunday. <laughs> it's what we're doing. <laughs> and so, somehow, David will be jamming on something we shouldn't jam on. Don't do it. But invite people here. Get them here. And so that's the challenge for this week. This week, invite one person to church for next week. Next week, I'm talking about the message sound doctrine. If you've ever invited somebody to church, you want them here next week because we need to be able to identify sound doctrine from false doctrine. That's where it starts. And we are living in a time and in a world where churches are just spewing false doctrine after doctrine after doctrine. And we're going to talk about how to identify sound doctrine, the importance of sound doctrine and we're going to combat some of the false doctrine we're seeing in the church today. So this week, invite one person to church next week. If they go to some other church, you're like, well, they go to another church. Fantastic. They, they already have cleared their Sunday. So they can come. Come here. Invite strangers, invite friends, whatever it is. Get them in here. We want this place filled. It's important. Church family, we love you, and it's our joy and it's our honor to serve you and serve you in this capacity, and we are doing our best to stay out of trouble and stay in faith, but we need your grace. And just like Bob asked you to pray for him and his cancer, I would ask you to be praying diligently for your church leadership. It's been a really challenging year and a half to lead in any capacity. The church has been incredibly, incredibly volatile, and I've talked about all that. We're not, we don't need to unearth any of that again. Slowly but surely, we're starting to see people come back. We want this place filled so that we can connect people to Jesus so that we can equip you to go out and do the work, the good work that God has prepared in advance for you to do. So this week, be praying for your church. Be confident in your leadership. Be confident in the church. Start to prepare yourself to hear a sermon on sound doctrine next week and invite somebody to church. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, this is certainly the this is probably one of the most challenging sermons I've preached, Lord, just for me personally, because I'm going through this list of qualifications, and every time I read one, I'm like almost reliving my own failure in these areas, but I have to remember that I'm not sinless, but I am sinning less. And Father, I thank you for that progress. Lord, you've given us a great responsibility here to lead your people. And you've given your people a great responsibility here to support and hold accountable their pastors and their elders. So Father, I pray that they would do that. Lord, that you would protect our church from anything that would not bring you honor and glory. Father, I pray this week that we would be bold. It takes boldness to invite somebody to church. It takes boldness to say, hey, you got to check my church out. Well, I go to another church. Yeah, but you got to check this one out. And Lord, we're not doing that because we think the band is good or because I think I'm clever in some way. But Lord, I know I'm going to preach your truth. And I know the songs that we sing 
are songs that are biblically sound. And I know that what our kids learn in the East Wing and what our students learn and what our small groups study, all of this comes from your word and your word alone. Your word is pure and holy and right. So Father, I pray that we would be diligent, that we would be bold, that we would be, or dare I say, aggressive in our evangelism this week. And a part of that evangelism being inviting people to join us as we talk about sound doctrine. Father, we love you. We thank you for this church. I thank you for all of these uh, people here, listening, watching. What a blessing, what a joy it is to have a church family. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for joining us online. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next Sunday.